Welcome, Welcome back, everybody. We are so happy to be resuming our conference this afternoon. We will be hearing next from two sisters who will speak with us about lived experiences. And uh, Marie Paul will introduce the, the sisters. To speak of the facets of the difficulty of finding one's own identity when living with the disorder, it is my great privilege to introduce Bria Paley. Bria has a multitude of talents and creative interests. She is a writer, a fashion designer, a singer, and a background actress. Bria is a New Yorker, and she has also lived in distant places. Her family has been a constant anchor point, and along with being a daughter and a sister, she has been delighted to become an aunt recently. Joining Bria for this segment is her sister, Nama Paley Rose. Nama is a senior philanthropic advisor at Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, where she is particularly appreciative of any opportunities to fund nonprofits that focus on mental health. Nama is equally devoted to family. She is the mother of Bria's adored nephew. And since Bria's diagnosis five years ago, she has learned and embraced family skills towards nurturing her and her sister's relationship. Bria and Nama, thank you so much for being here with us. Hello. Oh, thank you. Um, Nama, she's going to come back. <laughs> so um, good afternoon. The first time I ever heard about borderline personality disorder was when my cousin in Australia was diagnosed with it. She's a few years older than me. I had been living in, in Sydney, and she has suddenly dropped me from her life. I was very hurt. When I heard she'd been diagnosed, I had no idea what it meant, but I thought, wow, she must be really messed up. She deals with her pain by getting tattoos. But a few years later, my mother told me to check out the DBT Center in San Francisco, where I received my own BPD diagnosis. This was in 2016, and I was 33 years old. It has taken decades of therapy to finally begin to understand myself. It has also taken the medical world a long time to catch up to BPD. I'm very open about it, but I rarely encounter someone who really knows what it is. I still forget some of the criteria when I'm trying to explain it. It's a perplexing disorder because it manifests so differently in each person. For a long time, I thought I was cursed. I had such intense emotions as a child that they scared me and the people around me. I don't remember everything, but there was a permeating fear I felt, the fear of existing. I'm the oldest of three children. My sister Nama is presenting with me today, and I'm so grateful for her support. I know I wasn't easy to grow up with. I was abusive, push, pushed boundaries, and refused to follow basic rules. As a teenager, I got multiple piercings in downtown New York City, where I was in school at the time. I actually thought I could hide my nose piercing once I got home. As you can see, I still have it. My parents did the best that they could, and they sent me to many therapists and specialists from the time I was a young child. I was usually resistant. They even tried art therapy under the guise of a private art lesson. While I didn't have a BPD diagnosis at that time, I was diagnosed as a teenager with OCD and then ADHD. I couldn't stand anything that felt out of order to me. I'm highly intuitive and always knew when Nama had taken something of mine without asking. When asked by my parents to do the dishes, I refused. It became such a fight that my parents eventually gave up trying, leaving my siblings understandably resentful. It turns out that you can't go through life without washing dishes or avoiding what's uncomfortable. That has been a hard lesson to learn. I am still a rule breaker and COVID became a real trigger for my outburst this past year. I live in Astoria, Queens in New York City. My neighborhood felt more relaxed than other parts of the city. My family, on the other hand, they live in Brooklyn. They followed every rule strictly. I think of myself as a rational person but my brain decided that my family had rejected me. It took, I, I took everything personally and told myself that I had lost my family, that they didn't love me and I'd need to find a new family. I felt victimized for thinking differently, but what I really wanted was special treatment. There were many tears, joint Zoom therapy sessions and hurt feelings. 
The other sadness for me was missing out on extended time with my young nephew. Nama met me outdoors and tried to be accommodating. But it wasn't until recently when we both got vaccinated that I felt we could start to put this painful chapter behind us. We had hoped to present at last year's conference. I'm glad we are here today, but a lot has happened since then, and this is a different presentation than the one we would have given. I love Nama very much, but it's hard to see life from her point of view sometimes. She's married with a second baby on the way. I am single and have a history of unhealthy relationships. The topic of this year's conference is identity. That word has overwhelmed me at times because I have had many different identities. My career has taken some dramatic turns. I started out as an arts journalist, then got into sales, retail, and customer service. I wasn't able to hold on to a job and had no idea what to do next. I often got distracted by personal problems and felt angry when a supervisor had me take on a task I didn't want to do. Another part of my identity is being Jewish, and I'm proud to be involved with a number of communities. Around two years ago, I published an article on being a Jewish woman with BPD. I got a lot of great feedback about how it helped people understand the disorder and how brave I was to share such a personal story. That was validating to hear, but to be honest, it doesn't feel like an option for me not to share. I see myself as an advocate, and I know that hidden pain and shame make everything worse. I had enough of that growing up and not understanding what was happening to me. There are resources and people to help me know that I'm not alone, but it's not something that many people are forthcoming about, and it takes a, a level of trust to talk about it. I found that the more I tell people I have BPD, the more I meet people who tell me they have it also, or they know someone who does. I've made many connections that way. People with BPD are known for impulsive decisions, and I am no different. Whenever I would feel frustrated, frustrated or bored, I would book a trip somewhere, whether I had a job or not. These vacations were usually an escape from reality. Friends would ask me how I was able to afford the trips when I wasn't consistently working. I'm very resourceful and I found flights on sale and stayed in youth hostels or other budget accommodations. I actually took a job as a travel agent so I could get the discounts. I'm all, I also began participating in the gig economy I realized I could make good money by renting out my room on Airbnb while I was traveling. While these, trips be, while these trips became excessive and addictive, I learned so much from seeing the world, often on my own. I navigated cities I'd never been to and recovered when things went wrong, like my passport and wallet being stolen in Buenos Aires. Traveling helped me feel capable, strong, and resilient. I hit a breaking point in 2016 while living in San Francisco. I was newly diagnosed and I went through a tough breakup, which meant moving out of the home I had been living in. I was scared to be alone and felt like I had nothing to hold on to. My parents encouraged me to come back to New York City and stay with them for a while. For five months, I worked on picking myself up again. Some days I couldn't get out of bed, but after some time I found a great DVT therapist who I continue to see and that really helped. I was finally living in the same city as my family for the first time in 11 years. To be honest, it felt easier to live far away and simply not deal with working on my family relationships, particularly with my siblings. But we were raised to be close and family is important to me. I missed out on a lot while I was living in Sydney and San Francisco. So I decided to permanently stay in New York. My sister was newly pregnant with her first child and I was so happy to be around for that. With the help of my parents, I was able to find an apartment in Queens it has been my safe haven and I'm grateful for it every day. I'm still an Airbnb host too. When my nephew Isaac was born nearly three years ago, I felt a love I'd never experienced. Watching him grow up has been a huge gift. I still can't believe it when he says my name or tells me a new thing that he's learned. I also have a, young, have a younger brother and we have been able to work on our relationship through regularly scheduled meetups. It can feel like slow progress to me, but it is progress. My life these days is in transition. I want to say that I also identify as an addict, but not of substances. I get addicted to people and to relationships. I also struggle with codependency. I discovered Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, and it has really helped me. A symptom of BPD is fear of abandonment and a pattern of unstable relationships. I get emotionally attached easily and quickly and think that another person can take away my pain and solve my problems. 
My last relationship ended in February and I still have very hard days. With the help of my program, my sponsor, and my therapist, I'm learning what matters to me most and to give myself the things that I need. In recovery programs, they recommend the HALT skill. This stands for hungry, angry, lonely, tired. In DBT, it might be the please skill when feeling particularly low. This may seem obvious, but to someone with BPD or to an addict, it is not. I have to check in with myself a lot to see what I need in that moment and why I may be triggered. Then I can hopefully avoid an outburst. As a young child, I escaped into fantasy as a way of dealing with my fear, which turned into anger. I felt misunderstood and I still do. But now in my recovery program, I attend morning Zoom meetings of 100 women who feel the way that I do and that helps me too. The 12 Steps is a spiritual program that really focuses on the relationship with God or a higher power. The first thing I do when I wake up now is thank God with Moda'ani, a traditional Jewish prayer. The text says, I thank you, living and enduring King, for you have graciously returned my soul within me. Great is your faithfulness. We aren't guaranteed anything in this life, and waking up every morning is a blessing I express gratitude for. When people ask me what I do for work, I don't have a simple answer. Before COVID, I worked as a background actress on TV shows and in movies. I had a lot of fun experiences and enjoyed dressing up and having my hair and makeup done. I got to be on the set of some of my favorite shows, including The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which I even cut my hair, my hair for. But when production stopped for much of the last year, I had to reinvent myself again. I find that I have great strengths when I'm regulated. I began sewing masks and sold them to friends and online. I got back into writing and I'm working on a memoir. I love fashion and shopping, but my collection of dresses became unmanageable with limited closet space. I had an idea to start a fashion blog where every day I post pictures of myself in one of my dresses and tell a story connected to it. I try to sell a lot of what I post. I've kept it up for a few months now and it's been really fun to work on as well as good for my self-esteem. I think of myself as a model now too. It's called Bria's Closet and please feel free to follow on Instagram. As of today, I have nearly 1400 followers. I've always loved to sing, but when my choir went virtual during COVID, I quit. Recently, I began singing lessons and have been choosing songs to learn, which I then share on my social media. Social media is tricky for me. I post frequently and enjoy connecting with new and old friends, but sometimes I get overwhelmed by all the content on there and compare myself to others. But there's a lot of great support on there too, and I started following a number of BPD-related accounts. I'm pushing myself harder than I ever have before, and it's scary, but also exciting. My therapist told me that I'm on a warrior path, and that was nice to hear. Thank you for listening, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak at this important conference. Hi. Um, and thank you to my sister for going first and for sharing so openly about what I would definitely agree is a total warrior path. <laughs> I still remember the first time I Googled borderline personality disorder and found the criteria according to the DSM-5. I think I covered my mouth in amazement. It was like finally reading a job description for my sister Bria. Varied or random mood swings, impulsive behaviors, problems with anger, including frequent loss of temper or physical fights. I went through the list with my husband, Stephen, and kept saying out loud, check, check, check. For me, it felt quite liberating to finally see the list of her various characteristics articulated and captured in one place. And then, extremely frustrating, why had it taken our family over 30 years of my sister's life to settle on the right diagnosis? In preparing for this conversation, Bria bravely asked me to reflect on what felt scariest and most unstable about our childhood, about growing up with a sister who had undiagnosed BPD. By and large, I remember our childhood with warmth, marking the Sabbath together as a family, summer trips, weekends at the beach with cousins, trips to museum. But when I zero in on some of the particular moments, the patterns, the dynamics, I do feel myself re-entering some of the instability that overshadowed joyful moments. I can recall so many moments of being in the presence of Bria's frustration, witnessing her feeling misunderstood and invalidated. So many moments where she wanted one thing and the rest of our family wanted another. 
and none of us having the tools to come to a place of compromise. How irritated she was in confined spaces. How challenging long car rides were that often resulted in my dad pulling the car to the side of the road and yelling at us. How scary it felt to me to observe my sister throw a tantrum and one that often became violent towards myself and my younger brother. And then within moments, she would recover and then feel hurt that I wasn't able to recover and go back to playing with her as if the tantrum had never happened. It was scary. It still can be scary. And it's a lifelong challenge to have a sibling, to have any loved one with whom it sometimes feels like I don't always share a language or perspective of the world. Like we exist on slightly different planes and need translators in the form of experienced and trained therapists to even begin where the other one is coming from. I can't capture how powerful it was a few years ago when Bria invited me into a therapy session with her fantastic therapist. It truly felt like we finally had the translator we'd always needed, but never know what we needed to safely articulate our emotions and the experience of our relationship to one another. My identity, I would say, has certainly been strongly shaped by growing up and living in a family with a sister who has BPD. She went through periods of theft. In my teenage mind, it felt like my parents never seemed to punish her. I would get frustrated and feel like I couldn't trust them to manage our family. I still struggle with that, both in my family of origin and in other group settings. Not trusting that others are capable of taking the lead or following through on consequences. I got accustomed to having a sibling who had overwhelming mood swings. I now can see that I have sought out many close friendships with people who display similar behaviors, where I have historically been at the whim of similar mood swings. I go out of my way to try and be as self-sufficient as possible, one who can just manage things on my own because others need more support, which can be very much to my detriment. I need help and support too. Since receiving Bria's diagnosis, I have found a lot of comfort and relief. BPD is challenging, it's really challenging. And I've seen that the more I learn about it from professionals, from books, from others in my life who have BPD in their families, from a conference like today, the better tools I have to strengthen my relationship with my sister. I've always been an overeager student, the one who sits in the front row and raises her hand a lot, sometimes even the annoying one who reminds the teacher that he or she forgot to collect the homework assignment. In building, strengthening, improving, managing a relationship with a loved one with BPD, I've certainly learned that it's not so linear. When my son was a few months old and waking up at every hour throughout the night, I remember talking to a friend who also had a newborn. She looked frazzled, I looked worse. And I remember she reflected on her experience with her child. I'm a very results oriented person and this is not results oriented. I sometimes feel like that with my relationship with Bria. Last year, when we were asked to speak at the conference, as Bria mentioned, it felt like our relationship was strong and fruitful. We had developed a good routine of how often we were spending time together and her relationship with my son was truly blossoming and we were communicating well. When Marie Paul asked us to speak this year in place of last year's postponed conference, we both said yes. But again, as Bria mentioned this year, it's been a little bit harder. Our relationship has been in a bumpier place. Although I think we've seen a lot of positive points of connection over the past few weeks. Throughout the past year, we've both tried our best to use our skills to communicate effectively with one another and to support one another. At moments, it wasn't particularly effective. As she mentioned, she struggled with feeling rejected by me as a result of the COVID protocol my family was following. I found our relationship quite trying at times. It was challenging that we were on different pages regarding the pandemic, that she didn't give me credit for the time we did spend together. Only irritation about the time we lost. And yet, having Bria as a sister has truly taught me to value difference. It's drawn me to people who are different than me and shown me that the world around me would not thrive if we were all the same. It would honestly be awfully boring. I'm in awe daily of Bria's courage, how outgoing she is and her spontaneous approach to living life. In our twenties, we had the privilege of traveling internationally together a few times. It was incredible watching the way Bria interacts with and approaches strangers. Like the old adage, a stranger is a friend you just haven't met yet. I remember spending New Year's, in, New Year's in Uruguay with Bria one year during the trip when she mentioned she got her wallet and passport stolen earlier and witnessing her approach every stranger as a potential friend, sharing her stories about her life in Australia, her travels, her recent breakup. I don't have that kind of spontaneous um, and outgoing energy and it was quite 
spectacular to watch that on her and really an inspiration to me. That kind of honesty and openness and approach to life is quite remarkable. For all of us, this is an evolving process and one that we're grateful to do in conversation and in community with all of you today. Awesome. I am so thankful and so incredibly moved by your journey as it unfolds, Bria and Nana. It is a journey that is marked by dedication, by patience, by courage. It is marked by moments of peace and deep connection. And at times it needs to be marked by periods of radical acceptance. This is hard work and it is beautiful work. Can I ask each of you, perhaps starting with you, Bria, as you continue on this path that is your family's path, what is your hope going forward? So thank you for that question. Um, my hope is that we can eventually go on a family vacation <laughs> together <laughs> and that there will be more little kids in the family. Mm, beautiful. Thank you, Bria. How about you, Nama? What is your hope going forward? I think my hope is just that we can stay in dialogue and in relationship with one another. Um, I remember learning a couple of years ago, maybe from you, Marie Paul, um, that it's like actually quite studied that individuals with BPD really benefit from family engagement. And at the time, I remember not quite believing that because I can see, as Bria mentioned, sometimes how frustrating it is for her to live near us um, and how it can trigger her. But I think learning that, that even if we don't always recognize it, it's wonderful and actually quite critical to be in relationship um, has been really inspiring. We have in our own family, on one side of the family, our grandmother was quite estranged from her siblings. And on the other side, um, our family was all really close, even if there were clashes um, in personality. And I think as Bria mentioned, for us, family just isn't a question. Um, and that's why we put in the work and, and continue the dialogue and continue learning, um, even when there's definitely hiccups along the way. You are both an example of this path, and thank you so much for coming and sharing this journey with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.